Marshmallows. Marshmallows. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we got a bit uh, off topic. During the actual webinar, uh, we, we seem to, dr these guys are both in telco, so we've drifted a lot into telco specific information. But I think what people should take away from this is, is really about marshmallows. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today for another one of uh, Apogee's webinars. Today we're going to be talking about uh, telco innovation. And we've subtitled this The Need for Speed. We do love our, our 80s pop culture references here. But the, uh, the real idea here is that um, it's not speed in the way we normally talk in, in technology. This is, this is not the speeds and feeds kind of discussion. This is um, more like uh, agility as an organization, more like how fast can you react at the project level and at the product level to, uh, to changing conditions. And we're going to talk a little bit about the context, and then we're going to go into some specific action items. And so, uh, as always, I want to invite everyone to join us um, on the API Craft group. This is a Google group. It is a vendor neutral group. Nobody's going to be uh, selling your product here. It is, I, I believe now, the largest discussion on the internet of APIs. Uh, well over a thousand members. Great discussion every day. If you have any questions that maybe aren't quite right for this webinar, uh, it's a different topic, please feel free to join us there. That's kind of the after party for the, uh, the webinar also. We also have a, a YouTube channel to make it easy to get these uh, videos if you, if you like to consume your uh, your webinars and information that way, uh, just go to youtube.com slash apogee and you'll find all of our videos there. And if you subscribe, you'll, you'll get them uh, without having to check back every couple of weeks. And obviously we make all these, uh, all of our presentations are Creative Commons and we make them all available via SlideShare. So feel free to, uh, to take a look and uh, use them however you would like. So, uh, my name is Brian Pagano. I'm here at uh, Apogee's World Headquarters in uh, Palo Alto, California. I'm joined by two of my colleagues today. Uh, right next to me is Bala. You want to say hello? Hi, Bala here. And David. Hi. All right. All right. I hope they're chattier later on. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you just said say hello. I did. You're right. Just following, <laughs> following instructions. All right. So uh, so let's jump right into it because uh, I know everyone's busy. Um, we're going to talk telco specific here. Now, I think there's going to be value to other verticals out of this conversation, but this really is a telco specific uh, conversation. Yeah. Now, at Apogee, we, uh, we have the good fortune to work with many telcos all around the world, so I know this is a topic near and dear to our hearts, and you two gentlemen are two inside of Apogee that are very close to the telco space. So there, there's a, I know you guys have a lot of on-the-ground experience that we've kind of rolled up into these lessons uh, from, this, from this webinar. Yeah, it's uh, all telco all day long. All telco all day, so not just heavily involved. You're committed. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We are. Okay, so let's let's set the set the playing field here, right? I, I want to make sure that we're all um, talking about the same thing, and I assume that most folks listening will will be more or less uh, up to speed with this. But let's just make sure we're all speaking the same language here. So the marketplace, the current marketplace for for telcos and for consumers. Uh, Bali, you want to walk us through a little of this? Yeah, sure. Uh, as you probably know, telcos are probably the most pervasive, uh, you know, critical infrastructure almost in every country worldwide. Um, you know, bar none. I mean, probably in line with the utility companies you see there, which is offering water and electricity, pretty much. Right. Uh, and they also cater to a lot of customers, millions and millions of them, almost every part of the con uh, country, every part of the world. So th that is not only important, but also what's important is. Combined, I think the worldwide telcos generate about 1.5 trillion worth of business revenue. And that was US dollars. trillion with a T. A trillion with a T. That's a lot of money, and it's also uh, it also presents a huge opportunity and a huge target for disruption because it is such a big number. Uh, and I think when it, when we think about disruption, it's not just because it is a large number uh, or a big revenue number. Uh -huh. I think there are two key things why disruption is happening there. Okay. Number one, I think the consumers are finding very interesting and new ways to use what we used to call traditional telephony experiences. Okay. Uh, this primarily because of the devices and because also of the telco networks, which are much more high-speed now. Now, number two, on the high-speed network, because most of them have moved from voice-based network to a pure IP-based network, a lot of things are possible now, and that is another factor why the disruption is happening. Okay. Now, given those two factors for disruption, uh, you also have to remember, though, that telcos continue to operate under some sort of regulation almost in every country. Right. So they have that constraint. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, the key context you want to have around what ha what's happening in the telco marketplace worldwide. Okay. So anytime there's that much money on the table, 
I know from my Wall Street days. These are, anytime there's that much money on the table, there are going to be, it's going to be a prime target. People are going to want to get into that space. People are going to want to disrupt. And it makes the incumbents have to fight that much harder to, yep. to hold on to their share. And you're right, one interesting point, you know, I love this graphic with the, with the tangled wires, because they... The, it, looks, the, it looks like my desk. <laughs> I think this is actually history. One of my drawers. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think, I think it, it's true that we have to keep in mind through all of this that, and we'll talk about the, you know, the advantages and disadvantages that the, the telcos have yep. later on, but they are regulated. They are core infrastructure, and so they have regulation that maybe some of their new competitors, non-traditional telcos, don't actually have. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the, uh, the playing field has changed for telcos, right? So we just talked about what's at stake, the, the giant market we have here. And underneath that, there's some, some changes in the day-to-day -day life of these telcos, right? They're doing business in a different way. Um, David, do you want to talk to us about some of the most, perhaps the most significant aspect of this? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, and in some ways, it's like the golden age, right? Because you think about, uh, you know, when the internet was born, you know, I, I had my first Silicon Valley job at, at Netscape in the, in the mid-90s. I mean, it was a huge tectonic shift, right? That was 17 years ago when consumers started moving to the internet. And what we're seeing today is this, this huge tectonic shift as, as people realize that people moving to, to mobile, right? And, and um, you know, there's a, about a billion smartphones. Um, I've got some stats here, um, uh, subscriptions, but there's about six billion mobile phone users. So it's a, it's a huge shift. I think everybody feels it, knows it, right? And it's got a long ways to, to run, right? And you look at AT&T's earnings numbers, um, just recently, you know, great growth. Um, you know they had uh, revenue that was up about eight and a half, nine percent. Um, smartphone subscription penetration went from like fifty percent to sixty percent. So a lot of trends that are really moving uh, very favorably for the service providers. You know, but at, at the same time, um, you know there's this rise of the app internet, right? So if you think about what's the next wave of revenue beyond voice, beyond messaging. You know, beyond just data access, you know, what is that next wave going to be? You know, the way I, I try to describe this for people, if you take my phone, you look, if I want to make a phone call, right, uh, I can push this button, or I can push this button, or I can push this button. Right? If I want to send a message, I've got uh, several different buttons I can push. Right? Right. All, all these services, um, you know, used to, the interface for a voice call used to be a, an actual phone. Right. Now it's an app, right? Right, and pretty much any service that a service provider, that a telco is going to offer, is going to be an application, right? These days, right? And so there's a, a lot of uh, disruption that, that comes with that, and a lot of choices, and it's really the rise of uh, the app app economy, right? There's a lot of a lot of different ways to get services. So if I'm understanding you correctly, the uh, you're saying that while while the the market on the the mobile phones and especially the smartphones our fast rising market segment, there's more and more people getting on them every day, which is, that can only be good news for the yes. telcos. Yeah. What you're saying is that the, the smartphones bring with them a, a payload, which is these apps that may or may not be giving direct revenue to the, the telcos. Yeah, so. I mean, it's, 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 it is the application of, of everything, right? So any, any possible service, you know, my phone calls, my SMS, my voicemail, anything like that, my driving directions, it's now an app. Right. Right. And, that, and that can be, you know, from anybody. Right. Got it. And, and the, the good news and the opportunity there is also that if you look at the brick markets, Brazil, Russia, and China, the smartphone penetration is still below 40%. So there's a huge opportunity there where these devices are going to get more ramped up. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. I'm here, but I'm definitely hearing a trend here that there's a there's a huge opportunity for the the potential number of consumers, numbers of users to go way up. Yep. But again, each one of those smartphones is going to bring that hidden payload, which is Absolutely. it can be done through the apps, and it can be done through the the telcos app, or it can be done through somebody else's somebody app. That's that. that's very disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. so we've got some great graphics here. Like we've got yep. one up here it shows the app store growth. I think most people are familiar with that. Um, there's also another uh, great graphic um, that talks about the the growth rate of APIs. Um, because uh, apps are fed by APIs, as we know, right? Right, and so they get their data, they get their functionality from a backend API someplace. Right, you know, just and as the apps have been growing, uh, the APIs have been been growing uh, exponentially as well, right? And and so when you consider the fact that 
apps get their functionalities from APIs, if you want to go um, to the next one, when you're thinking about shipping a service, you know, whatever the, your new offering that you want to ship is, it really should be shipped as an app, and it should be shipped with an API at the same time. The app should be built on the API. It shouldn't try to you know, ship a service and then say, oh, and maybe I should do an API. Right. Sh should do the API, then do the service on top of it. And it's, a, it's a very different change. That is a different way of, of doing things. But I want to I wanna reemphasize that, because that seems like the first not controversial, but the first very important declarative point we're making at this webinar, which, which was, if you're a telco, every service you're producing right now should be built as an API and then as an app. That's right. That's right. It's a very different way of thinking, because if you think about most telecom companies in the past, they're very used to shipping consumer end, end services, right? And some of those services, the interface, I wish I had brought, you know, it just used to be a hardware device. It was a phone. Right. Right. Or, some other device, right? And now it's it is an app, and that app should be tethered to an API, and really, you know, the whole eat your own dog food mantra should be building that app on that API and releasing them at the same time. That that's an excellent point. All right, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about another another kind of paradigm shift where you know if you're a person like me coming out of enterprise IT, we we've, we've done things in a, a certain way, and it's brought us success. And you guys have heard me on these webinars before say it's, it's very rational to do what has brought you success in the past, yeah. unless the context has changed, yeah. right? And I, what I'm hearing here is that the context has changed, in which case it is not a great idea to keep doing the things over and over that were applicable to the previous paradigm, but not the current paradigm. So one of the things we used to do is we used to try to muscle through by hiring lots of experts. Mm -hmm. We tried to innovate always from the inside. We tried to do everything inside the not built here mentality. Uh, and certainly telcos are not the, the only ones guilty of that. That's pretty much any, any enterprise. Um, you know, Bala, is that still the way they should be thinking? Uh, no. Uh, and, and the reason, I think you're right, and what we just said is that's very... That's set up, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that, that's very uh, applicable to telcos, too. If you think about all the innovation that's happened on the telco networks, right, from the time people used to have voice on it and then data on it and how easily you could do mobile conversation outside the landline, mm -hmm. all that is innovation within the telco, which happened within the company. Right. But now, I think the innovation is moving outside. So innovation is happening outside. And what I mean by that is I think you have an ecosystem, you have a set of people outside who can help you innovate both your company, your services, and deliver some great experiences to customers. And that's, I think, a very important point. Okay, and that sounds a little uncomfortable. If I were yep. any telco or any you know, enterprise company, that, that sounds uncomfortable to me. I'm used to doing things, I'm used to having total control inside. Yep. Now you're telling me to let people outside the company Innovate against my brand? Yep, and innovate and be part of it and participate with you in innovating. That's, I think, the critical part. I don't think you're giving up control as much as to you bringing them in and helping them innovate with you. It's just that you know they're extended part of your company now. And I think when we think about that, I think we, we think about three competents. One is, uh, like David mentioned, as you deploy a new service or you enable a new service, you really have to think of that with an API so that it's accessible and it's easy to use by anybody outside your company. That's mm -hmm. kind of very critical if you want to support this kind of uh, external innovation. Number two is, I think you also can do very interesting things to just actually bootstrap innovation, which is to create incubation or you know hackathons or, or you know share space in your office with, with some developers to come and do some interesting stuff. And I think that's going to be a big change because you typically have these closed big offices where you, it, you only have your badged employees come in and you have to just mentally shift away from that and have people come in and help you with innovation. And then third is, I think, to really start treating these developers as almost an, a, a channel for you or an extended part of your company and a partner who can go and get you new customers and help you with delivering better experiences to customers. I think those three are very important points as you think about innovation happening outside the company and how you facilitate them. Got it. So with, so with a good API and a good API management program, they're not giving up control. They're, they're yep. still going to have security. They're still going to have access control. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what, what they're doing is inviting a lot of people who aren't even on their payroll Correct. to participate in carrying their business value out there. Yep. That's what you're saying. Yep. Yeah, and it's, it's actually it's worth the time to think about why this is going on and why this actually works really well, right? Because you think about uh, the market and the market fragments a lot, and you've got a lot of uh, different interests and things. It's you know what Sam always talks about is all the little niches, mm -hmm. right? It is just by laws of nature, right? And it's just impossible to fund 
all those different ideas to figure out which is the one that's going to work, yeah. right? And you think about, well, you know, we have an R&D program, we have an innovation program, you might have a VP of innovation or something like that. How, how are you going to fund all those ideas? Get them out of the market to figure out which one's actually going to work right. It's just, you know, it's an yeah. exercise in futility. Right. <clears throat> so you make it very easy to engage with people who might have a passion around whatever, wine and, and something else, whatever, and they figure out a new combination to bring it together. Got it. And then the you know the one last point you guys said that um, they should build the API first mm -hmm. and then build their app. So I I don't think there'd be a lot of argument that everything needs to be an app right now. That's certainly the the trend that I yep. think everybody is seeing. Yeah. Um, you now we always say here that the the whole reason for having an API is so somebody builds fantastic applications against that API. That's right. So am I am I right in assuming that they're just missing a prime opportunity to test their new offering, to test their service by not building their app against the API that they've built right now? Yeah, there's absolutely, you know, the the rule of the old rule of dog booting definitely definitely applies, right? Because if if you're building, you know, what we call first party apps, if you're building those apps, you know, directly on your API, then you get tons of testing and feedback already. And so by the time you're ready to launch the app, you know, the API has already been put through its paces, you know, you've already discovered some of the warts and you know you've polished off all the rough edges and you can put it out there. Excellent. Excellent. Traditionally, the, uh, the you know some of these telcos have been competing with each other for a century, right? Some of the, some of these telcos have they 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 know who the players are, they know who the, the friends and enemies are, and um, and they they've each carved out you know uh, many of them very successfully, you know millions and millions of subscribers. Yep. They 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 have built a they've built a garden. Um, I think um, that if we said that the whole point of having an API is to have somebody build applications against that API. The people who build those applications are application developers, mm -hmm. right? So it yeah. seems to me like a big key to success here is attracting developers, both getting developers inside your company excited, getting developers of partners excited, getting third-party developers excited, and is this gardened, you know, segmented approach the the best way to do that? Yeah, um, obviously not. You're great at the tee up. <laughs> 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 so when you think about some of the asymmetrical competition that's going on, right? And the way the market looks, right? This this goes back to hey, there's a you know, LTE's coming. It's going to be a big flat network, right? If I'm uh, using an app, um, you know, I might watch Netflix, you know, on my phone. I might watch it on my PC, and then you know, I might finish it at home on my set top box. I kind of want those experiences all to be the same, and I don't really care necessarily that I'm you know, watching it on Wi-Fi or on my wired home connection or, or whatever it is, right? It's one, one big flat field, playing field, and you know, these native internet players, whether it's a Netflix or a Facebook or a Twitter, you know, they see the world as their market because it looks like one just big network and addressable market. And so if, if some of these other players and these, some of these segments are, are competing for the world, then you should really think, hey, maybe I should do that too. Because you know, that's, that's the stage that you're on at this point, right? Um, the other thing that goes along with this is when, I think it's what you're alluding to, when, when you think about a developer using your services, that developer wants to reach an addressable market, right? And in an addressable market, you may have several hundred million subscribers, but the addressable market, they're going to be thinking in terms of the United States or North America, or they'll be thinking in terms of Europe. Well, you know, or if, or if they're some kind of a Facebook-related developer, they're thinking in terms of Facebook. You know, which, you know, now I think it was at about 950 million users. It's probably over a billion at this point. Yep. Right. That's that's the kind of addressable market that they're thinking of. And so it may be an uncomfortable thing, but you really should think about trying to present an addressable market to them, which means you might have to work with somebody who used to be your arch, arch enemy, right? Yep, yep, you, absolutely. One of your biggest competitors. And, and uh, so I think that's a, that's a critical point. And, and, you know, Bala, I know you've, uh, over the last couple of days, you, you've, uh, I know you feel strongly about this particular point. Um, is that, I'm not a, as much of a, a telco expert as you guys are, is that, I'm guessing here not in their DNA normally to be, or, or have they always made these different coalitions and cooperations? I think if you look at it, they have these coalitions, for example, today if you, if you take your phone and you travel to Europe, your phone works there. So there is existing yeah. collaboration that happens today. But I think those are very different than what we're talking about. I think here, the consumer is the developer. So going back to that theme, I think when you think about the APIs, the, the audience for that API is developer. 
when we think about the marketplace now, you have to define the marketplace for the developer. So hence, it has to be global. So when a developer comes in and looks at the API, it better work on all the networks. It's no longer just a roaming agreement like you do on voice or data, where you basically get charged by somebody and right. it just comes up and shows up on your bill. Right. That's an easy commercial arrangement. But here what we're talking about is actually the API working seamlessly across multiple networks and across multiple telcos. So that interoperability is, I think, key if you want to be successful on APIs across networks. The, the other point I want to make on this before we go, and this is this, this last point. When you're thinking about releasing a service, right? And obviously now, after this webinar, you're going to be releasing it as an app. Right. You, know, you, you, want, <laughs> you want to make sure that that app is usable by anybody. Yeah. Right? So, and, and a good example of this recently uh, was Telefonica in a release, something that was kind of controversial. They released Tuni. You know, it's an instant messaging and sharing application, and you can call people and stuff like that. Anybody can use that. Now, I've got it on my phone. Right? It's, it's, it's meant for the global stage for yep. any, any user. Now, you, as, a, as a service provider, you may release that, and you know, it may have some natural advantages on your home, home network. Maybe you know, all of your subscribers already have accounts on it or, or whatever. Um, but you really want to release services that can be used by anybody and not just restricted to your own network. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think if you look at even T-Mobile, for example, they have an app, app called Bobsled, which is very similar. Yeah. And it is interesting that most of the users actually are not in the US, even though the, the product was developed right. by the US uh, T-Mobile division. Yeah. It's a very popular app, and it's being used by a lot of international folks. And they're getting used to this fact that, oh, now we have to actually take care of these as customers mm -hmm. who are not just T-Mobile subscribers. They could be anybody anywhere in the world. And that's, I think, a big shift that's happening. I see. So it's an emergence of a, of a new class of customer that's not necessarily a traditional subscriber. Correct. But it's still a customer. Yes. Right. Still a customer, still a yeah. user. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, you know, we've started to allude to, to this next point here, which is, uh, you know, these, these telcos have been competing against each other for many years, many decades. And I know when I've had conversations with, with uh, some of these folks, I'm always surprised that the, the company that they're concerned about is not who I think it's going to be. It's not, the, it's not the big logo that you see on the, on the television commercials. It's, in fact, usually someone like Google or mm -hmm. Apple. Uh, so um, is, this, is this just the, the couple of telcos that I've been speaking with, or is this, is this across all of them? No, I think we, we, we see that the telcos have to really start thinking that their competition is not another telco. If that's the, that's the lens they get into this, then it doesn't matter whether they have APIs or great services or not, they're going to fail. Uh, they have to really open up and see who's competing. And the simplest way to think about this is the competition should be anybody who has a global network which has apps and experiences across devices, mm. right? And and that's what matters. Not just and people it, who have thousands just, yeah. of miles of cable and trenches no. and got it. If, if got there's it. a global network Towers. and you can consume it through apps and experiences across multiple devices, there you have a competition. And yeah. that's how they should think about it. So, so David, that, that to me is very interesting because now you're talking, I mean, these companies can clearly compete. You don't stay in business this long without being able to compete. Awesome. But, but now you're competing against somebody who has different regulations, like we mentioned than you earlier, has yeah. a, different, a different way of addressing projects, a different way of producing, different cycles for doing this. So am, am I right in thinking this is a very different kind of competition for the telcos? Yeah, absolutely. In, in different in two ways. So there's the market side and then there's kind of how you execute, right? And on the market side, still a lot of thinking has to go into this, right? Because a lot of times it's very asymmetrical competition, right? You might have a competitor for one of your value-added services on, on your network, and they get their money not by selling the service. They're just happy to give that away for free because they make their money on hardware. Or maybe they get their money from search, and they're like, well, you know, I'll just give away messaging, or I'll just give away voice calls, not an issue, right? Or, or you know, maybe they're uh, somebody who will give away the most valuable um you know, a section of the most valuable voice calls to just get, you know, yeah. little, little subscriptions of some of the calls uh, out of their own network. Right. right? They and just have very different economics around, you know, no regulation or other things that they're doing. So right. if I'm a telco, listening to this, thinking about this, that, that sounds like a pretty scary proposition, what we're talking about right now. Now, I, I can see on this slide we've got the, the, the idea which is, because I'm thinking, how do I react to that? Because I am who I am. You know, we've built up this organization. We've got a culture. We've done things that have made it successful. And now all of a sudden you're saying that the context has changed. It's an app economy, mm -hmm. all driven through APIs. And now I have competitors who are completely different than anyone I've ever competed against. So 
you know, I'm guessing based on what you guys have written on the slide, that the best thing for me to do is to start thinking like these competitors who are being successful in this space. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to totally think like them, right? But it's certainly worth uh, opening up the playbook and ripping out a few pages, right? And saying, hey, here's some, here's some good things that we can do. Um, you know, one of the things is you know, this idea of uh, failing fast, right? Doing things in uh, an iterative way, right? So, um, you know, there's been a lot that's been written about you know how uh, Amazon executes projects. Um, you know, they have edicts. Uh, I think it was I can't remember who it was it blogged you know internally about hey no nothing is built without an API. Uh, you know the, their concept of the two pizza box teams. Uh, I think those are all good good concepts to to bring in. You know I think when we think about telecoms we traditionally think about you know really big infrastructure projects. Um, you know five nines of reliability. You know, really super high quality. That's not always how services get rolled out. You know, they get rolled out very quickly. Uh, kind of a, a minimum viable product, you know, very good experience, but minimum viable product, and then they iterate, right? And it could be really small focused teams that represent a cross section instead of you know having a, a huge army that executes these things. They're much faster, much higher cadence. Um, they get rolled out. I see, which is sounds like a very different way. We're used to the telcos being just telco grade, we say. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so what you're saying is this, this app level, you might arrive at telco grade, but you arrive at by getting minimal, minimum viable and get out in the marketplace and, and you iterate. Right. I'm understanding. And you, okay. get, and you get feedback um, that way as well. And we're, you know, you'll get um, alpha feedback, you get beta feedback. You know, we were joking yep. the other day when we were talking about this that, you know, Google Mail was in beta for like two years or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. You know, we, but you get out quickly, get your user base going, and then figure it out from there. So, so we had a good question come in on this topic, which was, um, uh, you know, someone just asked that, is it possible for telcos to, to close some of this gap via acquisition, right? Can I just acquire some technology companies? Is that a fast way to, to close this gap? Yeah, I, I think so the, the two ways to think about this. One, I think, is that going back to David's point, I think your traditional telco services had to be rigorously tested because they were... In, there's a term called telco grid or dial tone kind of reliability, right? So that's always going to be there. But then when you think about the apps, you can roll them out differently and you can go through a life cycle stage differently. That's kind of one point. The second point is going back to our comment about innovating outside your company speaks to basically the acquisition angle, which is that if you have enough developers and enough companies innovating on your services and your APIs, it allows for you to pick and choose hey, that's an interesting opportunity in a space and a business area I want to go into, and this app looks very promising. Mm -hmm. How can I take that and go run and double down on that? And that's a good way to think about it yeah. when you think about acquisition. And, yeah. and we've seen a lot of telcos do that over a period of time. Well, you've seen, uh, you've seen this in, in you know, different API platforms, right? So you yeah. know, Twitter's famous, they've acquired you know, some, some a bunch clients. of small companies. Yeah. Right, so that, that, that has happened. It caused a little bit of an uproar at the time, but you know, that's the way to go. But I think the contrarian view on that too, though, is there's you know, some really large kind of organizational changes that have to take place. And you know, acquisitions to bring in a piece of technology here or a piece of technology there, they may not necessarily solve that. Right? And we were having this debate the other day about, yeah. hey, you know, do you set up a separate group to go off and do this? And there's some pros to that. Say, hey, you know, I'm going to set up a digital group, or I'm going to set up an innovation team, and we're going to go try to you know, do things very differently, and maybe you acquire uh, an internet service company or some, somebody else like that and some DNA yeah. to get that thing going. You know, but that, that's outside of the main organization. And the main organization has to change as well. And so it's a, it's a very painful thing, but the, I think the... The other thought, and the one at least that I subscribe to, is you have to really change the whole organization. You have to do it from inside the organization. You can't do it from outside. I see. So I think I'm understanding both of you, that the acquisition can be a quick way to get some talent in-house who are mm -hmm. used to these digital technologies, these, you know, these languages and platforms that have to be built on. Uh, it can bring in some experience as yeah. to how to do this, but if you don't use it as a lever to change the culture of the organization itself, it's more of a band-aid. Am I understanding you correctly, David, that it, yeah. it's not going to solve the problem if you don't also pivot as an organization? Yeah. Long yeah, time. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you know, in some of these some of these changes that you know we're talking about as well, just to give give an example, when you think about shipping a product, like most um, telecom organizations are really used to shipping a consu uh, consumer end product to their subscribers, right? And you think if you're a product exec and maybe in charge of a, you know, whatever product inside uh, a telecom company, you know, voicemail or contacts or something else, 
suddenly now you're forced, not only are you potentially shipping the consumer end product as an app, but you're also shipping an API. And the customer in that API is a developer, so it's a completely different thing, right? And when you think about product design, you may be very used to doing product design you know, for your consumer end app. Now you're doing API design. And what, is the, what does the developer want? Who does he care about, right? Maybe you were used to selling the app before, and now you're thinking about setting up some kind of a, a channel relationship mm -hmm. with the developers, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of organizational change and learning that has to happen. Okay. Got it. So um, we've talked a little bit about, if I were a telco thinking about what I've been hearing here today, I might be a little glum. I might be thinking <laughs> that, okay, so I'm, I've got all these disruptors, right? There's a lot of money on the table, but there's all these disruptors. A lot of them are by their nature, they're just, they're not as regulated, they're faster, they have more experience with these technologies, um, you know, so they've got some advantages against me. And I've heard some mention, like Telco Great has come up a few times here, yeah. so I know that telcos have some advantages too. Absolutely. You get, Bali, you want to walk us through some of the advantages? Sure. yeah. So, so apart from the fact that, you know, telcos inherently, as we all know, have run large infrastructure at a very, very high availability and reliability scale. And that, 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 I think, is a very important point when you're running any internet company and any large-scale worldwide service. So if you're running an API and a network service, like we mentioned again, global network with apps and experiences across devices, that really comes in handy because you want the service to be up all the time, it's reliable. So there is absolutely you know, a huge advantage from a telco standpoint there. They have experience in doing that. Okay. But there also, I think, a lot of other advantages which I think the developers really would want to take advantage of. So a few things come to my mind is, number one, if you look at any of the telcos worldwide, they all have a lot of retail presence. Either directly, they own retail outlets and stores, or they have you know, resellers or dealers uh, uh, who are reselling the products, both their devices and access to consumers. Now, that is a huge amount of exposure for a developer if they choose to, to have some interesting apps and experiences, whether it's a, just an app on the phone or an app going with another device, a companion device of sorts, that is a big, big plus point, which developers cannot scale, uh, and the, the cost of that scaling will be humongous if they were to do it on their own. Right. So telcos kind of bring that advantage into the developer territory. That's number, number one. Number two is, when you're a small developer and you suddenly have this thing, we always talk about catastrophic success, Right. right? you are just not equipped to go and build these millions of customers. You just don't have the infrastructure, and you know some people may not trust you because you're still a, a small shop getting famous. Whereas the telcos have an existing trusted billing relationship in almost every country with the consumer. They're a well-known brand, they have an established way of billing you, they have all the checks and balances, compliance, and all that stuff. So that's again a big yeah. advantage for the developers that, to that leverage. That's certainly something to remember because you know a lot of these guys are starting from zero. Yeah. They've gotta go acquire a bunch of users and you know as a, as a telecom company you have a bunch of users and you have a billing relationship with them you know and for some of them like you know, with me had a you know the same service provider you know for probably 15 years yeah right. and that's a, a long relationship right and and um, so that's the second point the third point I would say is also that if you if you uh, look at online ads if you look at your TV ads and the print ads I can guarantee you that in any country, almost one of the top five spenders happen to be telcos. Okay. So there's a huge amount of marketing spend that's going on to raise visibility and awareness around the telco products and services. Sure. And just a fraction of that exposure to a developer or an interesting app yeah. can do wonders to a, a new startup or a new developer company which has an interesting app on the network. So that's again a huge advantage that developers can leverage. Yeah, that makes sense. Like yeah. That's the old uh, iTunes or Amazon effect. You get on the front page oh, of yeah. those big on yeah, one day and you changes, changes your life. Absolutely. Yeah. But you, you realize that somebody is right now Googling. You said in every country that the telco will be one of the top five spenders. So somebody is Googling right now to find it for Romania or somebody is <laughs> an exception to that. So that, that is going to come back. <laughs> oh, in my past life, we have seen that happen. So, uh, yeah. So the, the, and the last point I would mention, this is, this is going to be a bit, bit of uh, a, a new thing, which is we talked a lot about consumers so far. But remember, the telcos have a lot of business happening through enterprise customers. Mm -hmm. Telcos have been traditionally selling into enterprises, whether it's devices, whether it's you know VPN, T1, T3 line access, and real-time presence, hosting, managed services. Right. They've been selling a lot of stuff into the enterprises. 
Now, if the developers treat that opportunity as a net new opportunity, they could never get into it. Right. That's again a huge strength that telcos bring to the table for developers. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's something we sometimes don't think about, but I think it's a very unique point yeah. which telcos bring. And having said that, the flip side of that is also that going back to the API and the service and how we telcos should think about it, I think there's an opportunity for telcos also to go back to the enterprise customers and yeah. rethink how they sell into the enterprises. Right. Today they're doing the same, uh, you know, hey, I'll sell you a T1 or T3 line, VPN, yep. hosting and stuff like that. But if you can wrap that up or package it up with a set of APIs, which right. make interesting things possible inside an enterprise, right. integrating with a CRM application and things of that nature through APIs or call control inside a contact center, mm -hmm. that becomes very, very powerful from a telco into enterprise selling perspective as well. So the API is not only great for developers, yeah. uh, long tail, large uh, public developers, but also yeah. for enterprise developers. Because yeah. enterprises are changing too. Yep. Enterprises are getting API based. Enterprises are moving faster. Absolutely. It's not just the, the, the end as, uh, as consumers. Yep. Right. All right, that, that is an excellent point, because I do think we focus on the consumer side, and we have also throughout this discussion, and that is still the bulk of the market, but uh, I, I think that's a great point that, that I hope everyone takes away from this, is to think about the enterprise side much like you would think about the consumer side and be more agile on that side also. Yeah. Yeah. And start with APIs and build apps. <laughs> of course. All right, so, so we've given a lot, of, a lot of food for thought. We've talked about the, the context of the, the current situation. We've talked about some definite actionable things, right? What are some of, the, some of the disruptors that the telcos are facing? We've talked about some of the strengths that the, the telcos can, can bring. Um, I think we'd all advise not to have them jump into these things without some idea mm -hmm. of what would make them successful what, and what is important to them. Because yep. there are different, different measures for that. Um, so how, how do they do that? I mean, what's the best way to go into this? Um, should, they start, should they wait six months and start tracking everything? I, I think we, like in any business plan or any, anything you get into, I think it is very important if not more for API business to have real good clarity on what they're trying to do with the API business and what the value prop for the developer and the end user is and then think about what is it for? Okay. Is, is, it, is it something I'm doing to get more revenue? Is it expanding my business line or is it about all about innovation because I have services which are stale so I'm gonna try and innovate on top of them. Mm -hmm. So I think at the top level you gotta have very clear what is the mission here kind of clarity. So you don't just build it and hope that somehow accidentally come. success no. occurs. No. Uh, while I think I agree with David's point about <laughs> you have to iterate, fast fail, but I think if you don't have the clarity that I'm going to try and do this for this purpose, then you kind of, you know, you lost halfway. Yeah. See, and, I, and Bell, I think, makes a great point, and I think he's absolutely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so this one place I'm going to have to digress is, you know, I think, I think that's great and, and you need to figure that out, but I think uh, the time is the enemy of everything here, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that you can get started, you can start building your APIs, building your apps, you can start releasing them to developers in the wild, and you can figure it out as you go. And, I, and I, don't, I don't actually believe that you can figure it out ahead of time. I think that you need to be in the game to actually figure it out and you need to try some things to figure it out. So okay. this is the point we're going to agree to disagree. Uh, so, so the way I think about this is, I, I think it's fine to figure it out as you go along, but I think you've got to be at least clear about, hey, this API program, for example, is all about adoption. So I'm going to measure how many of my addressable developers are using my APIs and doing interesting things. Or this is about you know, monetization. So I'm going to measure how much revenue I'm bringing in based on the APIs. Or is it about you know, uh, stickiness? I'm going to create some interesting experiences so that my customers will stay with me, and APIs are a way to enable that stickiness. And I'm going to measure reduction in churn through you know, customers. So okay. those are things you can actually focus on, measure, and then iterate. But if you don't have a measurement point, then I think you are just hoping that as I iterate, I'll figure out what makes me successful. That to me kind of sounds a bit dangerous. Hope, yep. hope is a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's all right. But I, I do want to make one more point on this, though, because I, I, I think this is important. You know, I, I started my tech career at Netscape. Um, you know, <clears throat> I did see companies who were like, oh, this is a, a new internet thing. You know, should we do this or should we not do this? This Maybe this is just a fad. You know, let's study it. Let's come up with a business plan. Oh, the business plan doesn't really justify. Maybe come back in six months and 12 months, we'll figure it out. You know, you don't want to end up uh, you know, like a 
Borders Bookstore or something like that, right? I mean, you want to, you, you don't want to be Amazon, as the, the phrase went. Yep. You, know, you, you really want to be able to figure this out. And I think the only way to do that is to, is to get in the game, get some stuff released. Yes, absolutely. You have to have the metrics and things like that. But, and this is actually a really tough point, right? Because it, what this is really saying, when it's, when it's this big of a tectonic shift, that you have to have senior, senior buy-in mm-hmm. that, hey, this is important. Yep. This is a huge shift. We're going to move on this, right? Because if you're trying to do this at an individual product level or something like that, it's usually going to be very, very difficult to budget justify yes. any particular yep. project. Yep. Right? Because you're going to be looking at these metrics and trying to figure out, you know, hey, what am I after? What, how am I going to monetize? You know, we see some of that dynamic today, and it was the same kind of debates that, that I saw back in the mid-90s when people were trying to figure out, hey, do I have a website? Do I get into e-commerce? Do I not do this? Ah, it doesn't really look like people are making that much money on this. And then just, you know, the math truck hits you. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And so just a reminder that um, intellectual debate is, is welcomed here. That's, that's very good. I'd like to do a reminder to the panelists that throwing chairs is strictly for <laughs> We'll move you over here. All right. So, um, well, I haven't had to separate you guys yet. So no, I, think, no. I think we've uh, escaped unscathed on that. So, all right, so we, we've, we've uh, dropped a lot of points here uh, throughout this webinar, and I think, it, I think it would be valuable to everyone to just do a, a quick wrap-up. Uh, I think this slide really illustrates the, the, the major points, right? We talked about everything should be an, an API first and then an app, every, every product, every service. Right, absolutely. You know it's, you know it's going to be an app. You know apps are fed by APIs, and so you just need to do in that order. Get your API, get your API build your app, and release them both. Okay, and then since it's all about... Developers, it's all about application yep. developers from partners, from third party. You got to be easy to work with. Yeah, so, so and this one is very important because I think this is a great opportunity, I think, for telcos to really break that perception where people and especially developers think you know it's, it's a huge bureaucracy to work with. Yep. It's tough to work with telcos. I think the API program lends itself very well to kind of break that mold and have a very easy and accessible manner in which developers can work with telcos. Yeah. I think it's a great opportunity, and I think it's an absolute must if you want to succeed. And, and we've had some of our own, because we always have telecom, yeah. telecom customers, yeah. we've had some of our own telecom customers say, hey, look, you know, we've spent the last 10 years pissing developers off. Right. And so we need to be very easy to work with. Yeah. And think yeah. about, hey, what's the you know zero to 60 experience you know, and working with us, mm-hmm. um, and you know, we've seen really easy to use API platforms come out. Um, you know, we've seen companies that have done uh, innovation programs. You know, AT&T has a foundry. Yeah. There's, there's these kinds of things that you can do to facilitate that and make it much yeah. easier. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then think, um, since we're trying to attract these developers, because we're easy to work with now, we need to think in a, in a global fashion, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We largest addressable market possible, because if I'm building this app, I want it to hit as many potential users as possible. Absolutely. Right. Right, and then learn from the new competitors, learn from the techniques of the internet companies, uh, possibly even acquisitions uh, of technology companies, but. Uh, if that helps, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Get, get started quickly, doesn't have to be five nines right away, right? Doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, Get absolutely. feedback, iterate, iterate, iterate. Iterate, iterate. Yeah. And, then, and then finally, uh, possibly my favorite point of the, of the whole webinar, which is leverage your strengths, compete on your strengths. You've got some things that absolutely. you do that, that these two developers in a basement somewhere can probably Absolutely. not even dream of doing, leverage those strengths, leverage Absolutely. what you've already got there. Yeah. Yeah. I think telcos inherently have been there for a long time, and I think uh, they have both financial strength and they have huge presence, and I think that's a big advantage when you come into the space like this, and I think they should play completely to that advantage. Excellent. Great. Well, folks, thank you very much for joining us for another one of these uh, webinars. Uh, we enjoy them. We hope you do, too. Um, Please join us on the API Craft group if there's any questions that didn't come up or anything that was maybe a little off topic, off this particular topic, feel free to ask there. Uh, Bala, David, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks, Brian. How was it? Was it fun? Yeah, it was good. This is my first one, and it's fun. Excellent. Other than missing the countdown, you did a great job. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you.